This is the incredible appreciation we have for the gospel and why our declaration of it, our pronouncement of it, the way in which we as recipients of the gospel transform relationships and transforms values. It's why when we understand the work of Christ in our lives and his work desired in this world, is that there's something about the way Christ operates that transforms what you prior prioritize and transforms what you might diminish. It's why the transforming power of the gospel needs to be applied to every system and every circumstance because the nature of Christ and his gospel radically changes relationships and values. Once you come to Christ, what you used to prioritize, in many cases, you no longer prioritize it. In many cases, what you used to minimize is now maximized. Why? Because there's something about the way you now see because of Christ that has changed what you used to revere and what you used to repudiate. Because the relationship of the gospel and why the gospel is so important in our lives and in our churches is because it redefines relationships and it redefines what you value. It's why in our churches we don't have any more time for pastors and preachers who are clowns who will preach out of ebony and jet but not out of the scriptures. We don't need people, teachers in our midst who no longer are committed to the truth telling of the gospel who only want to entertain us because none of those things has transformative power but Christ and the gospel changes things. Am I right about it? Isn't that how your life was changed? It was transformed not by just some moralizing but an understanding of who God is and, and how the word could change and transform, that power was manifested through the gospel. And when you think of this, it is why there's a difference between your embracing of the crowd versus the kingdom. Because there is, there is in this text evidences of the way God's presence, the person of Christ, is transforming the crowd in light of a more kingdom-driven perspective that enables us to see the redemption of how God works in terms of authority, how God works in terms of discipleship, how God works in time in terms of how he wants our lives to be manifested while still here. Look in the text, if you would. Verse 7 says, Jesus went out to the lake with his disciples and a large crowd followed him. They came from all over Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and from east of the Jordan River, and even as far north as Tyre and Sidon. The news about his miracles had spread far and wide, and vast numbers of people came to see him. Jesus instructed his disciples to have a boat ready so the crowd would not crush him. He had healed many people that day, so the sick people eagerly pushed forward to touch him. And here's what I want you to just appreciate, at least in some measure, that, that whenever the work of Christ is being accomplished, there is always going to be this sort of terror as well as excitement. In the text, there are people who are both excited about Jesus and others who are terrorized about Jesus. In fact, the strange thing about this passage is I can't really tell what's worse, his friends or his enemies. Because the friends who have come desiring something from him tend to be in a posture now where they will physically harm him. The so-called enemies of the synagogue want him dead as well. And what I can't really understand is what's worse, the friends in the text or the enemy in the text. It looks like both are poised to do some kind of damage but whenever Jesus is engaged in a process, whenever Christ is a part of a situation, there will always be a level of excitement and a level of terror. And it's something that every disciple has to get accustomed to and begin to appreciate because there's something about the opposition 
that comes from being identified with Jesus that challenges all of us as it redeems the relationships he allows us to participate in. In fact, when you consider this, you, you recognize that in light of the news about him that's spreading, they haven't come to hear him speak. They have come because they want him to do something. And I want to argue that I think that's fair. I think it's fair that once you know something about Christ, there's a recognition that he can do what nobody else can do. I think it's foolish to not believe and not appreciate that Jesus can do what rehab couldn't, that Christ can do what counseling could not, that the Lord Jesus Christ can change things in ways that nobody else could change them and prioritize him not only for who he is but also because of what he does. They come to this reality and what's at least impressive to Dan, Dan Williams is that the, the, the excitement about him brings him to a place where the potential of his being harmed is now made clear. Verse 9 says he told the boys to get a boat so that the crowds don't crush him. I laughed when I read this and I decided to YouTube a, a segment of Superman. Uh, I realized that there are people here who remember Superman before he got muscles. The, the old Superman was rather smooth. And we, some of us, used to watch that Superman on a black and white TV. I realize, young people, you, you think this is the antediluvian age, but there was a time when TV was black and white. There was also a time when TV went off. In a world of 24-hour broadcasting, that's what you saw. The screen went blank. There was the playing of the national anthem. And you couldn't watch TV anymore until about 6 a.m. Well, well, back then there was a Superman. And, and Superman was a smooth fella. And there's a scene where Superman is confronting some bank robbers. And so they pull out their revolver, they aim at Superman, and they shoot him several times. Bullets are bouncing off the man of steel. But then when the clip is empty and there's no more bullets, the robber throws the gun at Superman and Superman ducks. And, and I've always wondered if the bullets didn't hurt you, why when he threw the gun did you duck? I was thinking about this as I was reading the text because I hear Jesus say, get me a boat so that I'm not crushed. And I'm thinking, you're Jesus. You walk on water. You part the water. The, the rain comes down as liquid and returns to the sky as vapor because of you, Jesus, at your word. Why in the world would you be concerned about bruising and crushing? And here's what I've discovered. Whenever Jesus was engaged in the manifestation of miraculous power, he always did it with a certain economy. Jesus practiced a kind of economy for the utilization of miraculous power so that Jesus only performed miracles when they were outside the pale of his personal benefit. You see, Jesus used his power to always help somebody else never himself. And I think there's something about understanding how we are to relate to even our God that tells us it ain't always about you. Sometimes the power of God manifested is to be used to build somebody else up and to help somebody else become what they can never become unless your life is engaged. I'm all for the fact that he delivered me, but if he delivered me and you're not telling the story so that somebody else can be delivered, then your deliverance was not all it's supposed to be. And it's something about the way the Lord redefines how we utilize even power that changes it from being so personally driven to recognizing its utilization for public consumption so that somebody else can know that if he did it for you, he can do it for me. 
Well, we've got our covert Christian, secret agent Christians who need to get up and get out and tell somebody about a Savior that can save anybody, about a Christ that can do anything, about one who can transform situations. There's something else in the text, though, that I don't want to miss, and it is simply this, that, that Jesus also engages in this relationship with the demonic. Here inside, verse 11, and whosoever and whenever those possessed by evil spirits caught sight of him, the spirits would throw them to the ground in front of him, shrieking, you are the son of God. But Jesus sternly commanded the spirits not to reveal who he was. You know, the thing about Jesus is Jesus won't accept revelation from a demon. Because, because demons have recognition of who he is without relationship to him. And so Jesus rebukes them, silences them, and changes relationally the way we exercise and live under authority. Now let me offer this caveat. When you read the Bible, the capacity to name something is not nearly as common as it is in our culture. In the ancient world, when you had the capacity to call something by name, you then had control over what you named. This is why you should always reject other folks' label of you. You don't let anybody tell you who you are. You allow the Lord to do that, and whatever he says about you, that becomes true. Lord, I think there's something there that you need to... You don't buy in to what everybody tells you you are. They can call you an addict, but if you ain't using, you ain't an addict. They can tell you you'll never amount to anything, but when you know Jesus, you can appreciate the fact that, no, my life can be transformed, and I don't have to be like my daddy, and I don't have to be like my mama, and I don't have to be like anything you say I am because God has called me friend. In the ancient world, when you were able to give a name or extract a name, it meant you had power. That's why when Jacob is wrestling with the angel, or some say theanthropic being, the angel changes his name. And when he asks, what's your name? The angel says, essentially, none of your business. Because to be able to get a name and to give a name was a demonstration of authority. It's why in the Garden of Eden, Adam is given the responsibility to name the creation over which he is to have dominion. The problem is that that dominion has been reversed. And now all of the things we are supposed to have dominion over now have dominion over us. You see, you see every plant in the garden was named by Adam because Adam was supposed to have dominion over the plants. But now the plants have dominion over us. That's why you can't stop smoking weed. You were supposed to have dominion over the trees. Now the trees have dominion over you. You were supposed to have dominion over the grapes of the vine. But now unless you get some vino, you can't make it. You were supposed to have dominion over barley and hops. But now unless you suck down a six pack, you can't watch a game. Because everything you were supposed to have dominion over now has dominion over you. And Jesus says, no, I came to show you that I changed the relationship of everything. Shut up, y'all demons. You can't call me by name because you don't have authority over me. I have authority over you. And guess what you have when you know Jesus? You have authority that's been given to you by him over everything that seeks to take you down 
personally and institutionally. That's why we need Christian people who can identify what enslaves folks and challenge evil and usurp the authority of evil that enslaves people personally and institutionally. Church is supposed to be sent out to deliver people from what enslaves them. And the problem is that when ministry is concerned for the preservation of crowd, it can't be kingdom focused. When all you want is the crowd, you can't preach what you need to preach because you want to keep the crowd. When you are concerned about keeping friends, you can't say what Jesus tells you to say because you're more concerned about the crowd. And when you're not kingdom driven, you're crowd driven and you'll spend your life trying to please the crowd and never accomplish your kingdom agenda. That's why there's a danger to the church that falls in love with the crowd. And, and, and I raise this because you look and how Jesus does this as he redeems the role of authority in our lives. And here's what you realize. He recognizes the redemption of the power differential in everything that was supposed to have dominion that usurps it. He shuts it down. That's why some of your activity ought to take place outside of the church, not just in the church. You ought to be matriculating and invading space and redeeming space that is sacred for the glory of God. Why, Dan Williams? Because God is not only interested in people, he's also interested in places. And to redeem space to the glory of God, back for his sovereign honor and his rule. That's what we've been called to, but he does this. He does this in a way that I think is unique inside the text. And now the relationship of authority over evil, he says that belongs. He's not asking you to have weekly meetings on how to cast out demons. There's a reason why the word preach is there and preceding casting out demons because as far as Jesus was concerned, that was a priority of those he transformed from disciples to apostles. God, if we could get back to being those kind of people in our communities, in our homes, in our churches, we would see a, a revolution that couldn't be done by political entities, but only done by the power of God. And here's how he does it. It's in the text. He says it this way. He says in verse 17, 15, giving them authority to cast out demons, these are the 12 he chose. Notice, Simon, whom he named Peter, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, but Jesus nicknamed them sons of thunder. And all I want to say to you is, when somebody gives you a nickname, it's because they have another level of intimacy with you that goes beyond what they may be having with the general populace. For instance, you know this, if you're married, you have pet names that you have for your wife, you have pet names that you have for your husband, and nobody can call them by that name but you. Otherwise, there's a problem. I mean, your next door neighbor can't go get the mail and look at your wife and say, hey, boo. <laughs> Else there's a problem. Because nicknames carry with them a kind of intimacy that is exclusive. Am I making sense to you? So when Jesus looks at Simon and calls him stone, when Jesus looks at James and John and calls them sons of thunder is because he is identifying and highlighting, highlighting a unique intimacy with these three as a part of a core group of disciples that exceeds the other relationships he has with the other members of the 12. And when you look at this group of disciples, this is a motley crew. These are not people we should select. This is a tax collector. This is a political nationalist named Simon the Zealot. 
This is Iscariot, the one who will betray. These are fishermen. These are, in fact, Peter opened his mouth so much and put his foot in it every time that you wonder, Lord, why would you bother to bring, to bring this group in? And what I like about Jesus is that Jesus flies in the face of our Photoshop culture. You see, we live in a Photoshop world where the only pictures we post are the ones that are embellished, that make us look better. But Jesus snatches up people, warts and all. And that's who this group is inside this text. He brings them to him because when Jesus chooses people, Jesus chooses people on the basis of their potential, not their present achievements. I know you don't believe this, but that's who you are. He didn't choose you because you got something to offer him. Don't you know on your best day you've been a liability were it not for the power of God? You ain't never been an asset. I don't care how good you sing, how good you preach, what you do. You ain't never been an asset. You've always been a liability. But thanks be to God. The grace of God, the sovereignty selects, and here's why. Uh, God selects them in order to teach them. He draws them close. But then he tests them. And then he will transfer his power to them. Now, now here's what I want you to know. Carl, Carl Henry, a theologian, said it this way. God may be the greatest gambler in human history. You, you say, why is that, Williams? Because he bet the future of our redemption on this motley crew who would somehow tell of his grace, of his goodness, and why he's worthy to be served and trusted. He, he took these folks in order to get his message to us and to the world. He took 12 of a ragtag nobody, bunch of folks. He, he, he bet on some of the worst humanity has to offer in order to get the word out that God is still good and that God has sent his son and that you can be the recipient of his grace. And guess what? God is still betting on people who are just like that. He's betting on you. He's betting on me. He's, he's betting on us because of the reconciled relationship we have with him that would transform us as people who have not just been the recipients of his power, but people who now become channels of that power. If all you want to do is receive, but not recognize that what God wants to do is more than that. God doesn't want you to just be a recipient of his power. He wants you to be a channel through which his power flows. So that at some level, you become the answer to somebody else's prayer. That's a change. Because God has taken some folks and reconciled them and made them whole, changed the relationship in terms of the way we interact with God because of his son, changed the way we relate to power and authority because of his son, changed to a more radical orientation of how we recognize and appreciate God's redirecting priorities and values through a relationship with his son. That's why Christ ought to be praised. And he's done it in our lives. Do I have a witness? Yeah. Is there anybody here who can say, I recognize something, that God took a ragtag bunch and turned them into preachers. In fact, the text says the disciples became apostles because God is always redefining relationships, redefining values. And here's what you know if you could testify today, that there are a thousand things you thought were important and that you couldn't live without until one day Jesus took up the case. There were a number of things that you said, you know what, I don't think I can ever stop until one day Jesus took up the case. There were some things you said, I don't care what you say, I'll never forgive that until one day Jesus took up the case. You saw God transform relationships. 
You saw God transform situations. You saw God transform your very soul. And now the same people that used to curse folks out can now bless them. Because of the Christ who redefines every relationship. Glory to his name.